I, I literally did just get off the road. <clears throat> it's about seven, eight hour drive. Um, but I, I'm, I'm certain that after the, the show that um, a lot of you, I'm going to be seeing a lot of you over there. Um, can, we, can we dim the lights a little bit? Um, I got a lot of information. I got a lot of great slides in there. I think it will benefit from uh, having a little lower light and so you can see the pictures better. That's uh, Montana from space. And I forgot I was going to bring a trinket and um, say if anybody could tell me what mountain range that is, that I would, that I'd give you a prize. Is it the crazies? All right. Well, you were right. It is. All right. Um, I found that slide on the internet. I thought it'd be a great start because um, I'm going to be covering a lot of material and I'm going to be kind of drilling down from a big picture to a small picture. And I thought that'd be a great way to start to look at Montana as a whole before we talk about Makoshika. But first, uh, any Minnesotans? Anybody recognize my accent, you know? All right. Yeah, you betcha. Uh, any uh, current fans of Makoshika so far? All right. Oh, good. Um, I, I, again, I think you're going to love the show, and I think you're going to uh, want to see the park after you do. Um, but just kind of look at it in a, in a broader sense. Um, um, I'm a little, uh, I have a favor of, of, for Makoshika because I've worked there, and I have a, a sense of intimacy with it. But I do recognize that Montana has a really a fantastic park system um, in all its four, uh, 54 state parks. And as you can see, most of them are... Um, focused on the west, and that's because eastern Montana is about 80% private. So it's very difficult to, res to uh, secure resources in eastern Montana um, and provide them to the public. And so the, the few parks that we do ha have out there are really, really um, great gems, and they, they really are worth the drive over to see them. You know, Montana is a very unique state. It's the uh, fourth largest in the Union, um, has uh, great resources, um, everything from uh, temperate rainforest to badlands topography. It's really a big state, and I read somewhere that uh, it takes longer to drive from Yak to Broadus than it takes to drive from Washington, D.C. to Chicago. So it really is a big state, and it's hard to appreciate it unless you really get out and see it. Um, but I am here to talk about Makoshika. Uh, I was always hoping that would be a billboard. We call it bad lands. You call it good times. Um, Makoshika um, is Montana's largest state park. It's a little over 11,000 acres, and it's known primarily for, anybody want to guess what Makoshka is known for? Dinosaurs. dinosaurs, that's right. And the reason it's known for dinosaurs is because of that Badlands exposure. But there really is more to the park than just dinosaurs. That is our calling card, but it really has a great uh, biological depth to it. And I think you'll see when I'm done here that that, that bears true. Um, we just recently um, celebrated our 50th anniversary. Well, in 2003, and now we're 60 years old. And the park system is 75 years old. So uh, you guys, if you, you, if you need more information, go to stateparks.mt.gov. And keep in mind that you pay a small fee on your license plate, and that makes day use free in your state park system. So it's a great way to just get out and sample your parks, see the ones you like, and then come back for more. Um, I got one slide with sound. <laughs> That's right, dinosaurs. That is what we're known for. Um, but again, we're, we're much more than that, and part of it is because it protects such an extensive piece of Badlands topography. Um, again, the park is a little over 11,000 acres in size. That's about 18 square miles, and it's contiguous, which means it's all contained in one piece. Again, uh, I was just going to ask that picture, did you walk up to that spot where that picture's taken from, or is that an aerial view? Um, no, that's walking. And through some of the slides, you'll see the topographical changes um, that occur in the park. It is a very rugged park and it's very difficult to walk in, much more difficult than people give it credit for because it's very arid, very hot, very dry, um, and very loose, unstable um, as far as the soil type. So it can be tremendously challenging to walk in the park, but it's also very rewarding because the people who go into the backcountry are the ones that make the great discoveries, both dinosaur and just scenic beauty. Um, but we have this large contiguous piece of Badlands topography and one big piece that's being managed um, in perpetuity for the citizens of Montana. And its claim to fame is dinosaurs. But because it protects such a large piece of land, it can also claim other great fames. It's got a tremendous geology that's being protected. It's got a tremendous archaeological history. And it's got tremendous recreation and educational value. So while we like to uh, toot our horn on the dinosaurs, really it's, it's much broader than that in its appeal. And I think everybody, uh, every Montana can find something 
at Makoshka that they could connect with, even if they're not into dinosaurs. Um, so to talk about uh, dinosaurs in Makoshka, you really got to start a lot further back. And just give you an, uh, an idea where I'm going. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the, the interpretive history of the park, and then we'll talk about some of the resource management issues, some of the impacts on the land. I'll give you an idea of what we do for uh, interpretive programming, and then I'll let you see some uh, pretty pictures of the park. Uh, so, so to understand uh, Makoshka in terms of dinosaurs, um, you really got to go much further back than that and look at the geological history of Montana, of eastern Montana, uh, way, way before dinosaurs. And so when we talk to the school kids, we typically start um, with Pangaea or Pangaea. And most of the school kids remember that, the, the supercontinent, where uh, all the continents are connected together. They broke apart, and then the continents moved on the surface of the Earth until they made contact with tectonic plates, with oceanic plates, and then those continents started uh, sticking in place. And as they stuck in place, um, they started buckling and heaving, and that's what created mountain ranges and stuff. But back prior to dinosaurs, um, North America was still closer to the equator, and it was still somewhat soft in the middle. Um, and there was an inland sea, uh, referred to as the Western Interior Seaway or the Niobrara Sea. And that seaway was an active seaway that flowed from the Gulf of Mexico up across North America and it drained into uh, Hudson Bay and into the Arctic Ocean. Um, at its maximum extent, that seaway went from about the Rocky Mountains over to Minnesota, and it was about 300 feet deep. Um, during the Cretaceous period, which is the last period of the age of dinosaurs, from 135 million years ago to 65 million years ago, that seaway advanced and receded three times. So it took a long, long time for it to advance and recede over the interior of the continent. And again, this is prior to a lot of the uh, orogenics or mountain raising um, that was occurring in North America. And so the center of North America kind of sagged down and it was covered by the seaway. And um, even though we don't see the seaway sediments directly in the park, just a couple miles south of town, you can go down there and you can find shark's teeth, crocodile teeth, um, ray teeth, all sorts of stuff that suggest it was a very active and, um, and substantial seaway for its time. So again, all during the Cretaceous period, the seaway was advancing and receding across the interior of North America. And in that seaway was much of the big, scary things that one might expect to find in the ocean today. Um, this is a mosasaur, um, a large reptile that was common of, the, of that period, in the marine period. Um, fossils like this, again, can be found just south of town. So to find stuff like this in the Great Plains now, in a dry, arid area now, is pretty strong evidence that uh, regardless of the cause of the seaway, um, it was there and it was substantial. Uh, one of the things that uh, Moses Sarah liked to eat was uh, ammonites. Uh, ammonites are related to modern-day nautilus. Um, they lived in the end of their shell, and as they grew, they would partition off their shell and it had chambers then in there that provided them buoyancy. Um, many of these types of fossils can be found in the area. This is an ammonite uh, we have on display at the visitor center. It's about as big around as a hubcap. Um, for an ammonite, that's a big, big ammonite. Most of the ones you find are small. But one of the neat things about ammonites is that um, around the outside of the shell is a tube. And the, the ammonite creature uh, pumps air through that tube into the chambers of the shell. And that's what allows it to change its buoyancy or its depth in the water. Um, I don't know where it came from, but we actually have in our possession an ammonite fossil that shows that tube. And the pictures are a little blurry, uh, but you can see um, right there, you can see that tube. And that tube is what they use to put um, air into the chambers of the shell so that they could uh, maintain buoyancy where they wanted to in the ocean. And so there was this dynamic seaway existence going on for hundreds of millions of years in the central United States, depositing hundreds of feet of clays and shales, oyster beds, seashell beds, and all the marine life that lived with it. And that seaway stayed up through the, the end of the age of dinosaurs until at the end of the, ed, the, the Cretaceous period, at 65 million years ago, that seaway was finally receding from North America. And so you see what makes Montana so significant from the standpoint of paleontology or the study of dinosaurs is the edge of that seaway. Wherever the margin of that seaway was is where the dinosaurs wanted to live. And the reason is because the majority of dinosaurs were plant eaters. And they had to eat hundreds of pounds of food a day to survive. 
uh, much like modern predator-prey relationships like wolves and elk or Canadian lynx and snowshoe hares, there's always more prey than predator and it keeps it in balance. So we had these huge populations of plant-eating dinosaurs and they had to be where the plant growth was the most lush. And that was wherever the edge of the seaway was. So um, you've heard a lot about Jack Horner's work up in Shoto and Egg Mountain and that was over on the western margin of that sea when it was at its maximum extent. As it was draining off towards the end of the age of dinosaurs, you could see that it was draining off of eastern Montana and western North Dakota. And that's why we have such significant dinosaur deposits in Makoshika and the surrounding area, like up around Hell Creek and Fort Peck, Fort Peck Reservoir, is because they were staying wherever that water was still present. And that water finally receded off, and with it came the extinction of dinosaurs. Uh, about 65 million years ago, eastern Montana and the Makoshka area was similar to what uh, you could compare it to Louisiana these days. A lowland delta swamp, a lot of interbraided river channels and surface water, uh, very lush um, growth. The number of species of dinosaurs were not as populous as in earlier years during the age of dinosaurs, but the species that were alive at the end of the age of dinosaurs um, were, were very highly advanced. Um, evolution had given them some great successes both to deal with predator-prey relationships, but also with um, new food sources. Because as the dinosaurs were going out of existence, uh, flowering plants were coming into existence. And in order to capitalize on flowering plants, which were growing up in the trees, they had to develop, um, they had to evolve and adapt to new feeding strategies and specialized mouth parts and body parts so they could access and take advantage of that food. Um, but unfortunately for them, 65 million years ago, there was a catastrophic disaster and all dinosaurs went extinct. Um, the great extinction of uh, the end of the age of dinosaurs. Um, there's generally two theories bantied around. Um, one is that they gradually died out, um, and the other is that um, they were killed off by an asteroid collision. And there's a, uh, certainly a, an amount of truth to both. Um, uh, conditions were changing, as that map showed. The seaway was draining off. Um, they were not having access to the significant amount of plant life they needed. Um, uh, the meat eaters uh, were finding few and fewer plant eaters to eat. Um, I like to tell the students that uh, if you go to the grocery store and go to the meat department, uh, T-Rex would have to eat all of the meat in the meat department every day to stay alive. So it, it was very, very dynamic for them to eat, 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 and avoid being eaten. So as this water source was draining off the continent, as food was getting harder and harder to find, and those predator-prey relationships were becoming a little unbalanced, um, it was tough for dinosaurs compared to the 165 million years that they had dominated the surface of Earth. But there's even more evidence and more conclusive evidence that an asteroid collision is what actually caused uh, the dinosaurs to go extinct. Um, it's referred to as the Chicxulub Crater. Um, and it contacted Earth um, right around the Yucatan Peninsula in New Mexico, in the Gulf of Mexico. Um, when we started getting into space, um, we started seeing, um, as we started going over the equator, we started seeing this egg-shaped crater in the Gulf of Mexico. And that plus evidence found on North America, they tied the two together. Some of the strongest evidence that they find in North America that ties it to this crater is the presence of iridium, which is a mineral that's very rare on Earth and it's very common in asteroids. The asteroid crater is at a 30 degree angle facing North America. And all across North America is what's called an iridium splash, a very thin layer of iridium that is in the sediment layers all the way up North America. That iridium layer is much thicker in Texas than it is in Montana. So it's analogous to throwing a rock in a mud puddle. More mud's going to splash closer than further away. That plus a lot of evidence at that extinction line with respect to species found, both animal and plant, and how heat and pressure change some of those minerals, some of the uh, shapes of those minerals, all gives really strong conclusive evidence that an asteroid collision did occur. I hope I brought it. I got some great asteroid fun facts. I'll read through them real quick, but it, uh, it really helps to put perspective on it because oftentimes I'm asked when we're on tour, um, well, if this asteroid hit North America, how'd that kill things in China? And so if you get an idea of the significance of the asteroid, it'll give you an idea why it was cataclysmic worldwide. Um, the asteroid was six miles in diameter, and it had a weight of about one million tons. 
its velocity at impact with Earth was 45,000 miles per hour. That's fast enough to travel around the globe twice in one hour, and it's equivalent to 750 miles per minute or 12 miles per second. So you can imagine it coming in at 45,000 miles an hour, hitting the Earth at a 30 degree angle, and exploding up across North America. Its passage through the atmosphere raised the temperature of the asteroid to 35,000 degrees Fahrenheit. The brightness of the asteroid as it passed through the atmosphere was brighter than one million of our suns. At impact, the asteroid transferred one million megatons of energy to the Earth's crust. And that's estimated as being more than all of the, the energy contained in our nuclear arsenals worldwide. The fireball was visible from 3,000 miles away. And that's one-eighth the distance around the globe. Seismic waves from the impact caused volcanic eruptions, which released enormous amounts of poisonous hydrogen sulfide gas into the atmosphere. That contributed both to blocking of the sun, but also contributed to acid rain, which further killed off what plants had survived the impact. Debris from the impact was hurled into the atmosphere at a velocity of 100,000 miles per hour. And that debris then fell down to Earth, and it included boulders the size of buildings. A 15,000 degree Fahrenheit dust cloud spread over the surface of the globe in just two hours. And the air temperature reached a temperature up to 500 degrees Fahrenheit, up to 500 miles from the impact site. Air temperatures in Mongolia, halfway around the world from the impact, reached 300 degrees Fahrenheit only 90 minutes after the impact. That's, that's um, hot enough to do barbecue. So within 90 minutes, the air temperature was 300 degrees in China, around the, halfway around the world. It caused uh, uh, superheated sandstorms. It caused firestorms reaching 1,800 degrees Fahrenheit, which burned the forests of the Pacific Northwest. It caused seafloor shifting and tsunamis. It really had a global impact because of the energy that was displaced to the Earth so suddenly and in such a pointed fashion. And again, so when it exploded, that material blew up across North America. And in North America, 70 to 90 percent of all living um, material, plant or animal, was killed immediately. And what wasn't um, was probably consumed by the seismic waves, um, the, the uh, firestorms, uh, and the superheated air. And then that superheated air rippled all the way around the globe. Within a couple of hours, it had passed around the globe and already started blocking out the sun. And these large plant-eating organisms that needed hundreds of pounds of food a day and that were cold-blooded and required a very stable environmental condition, and then the meat eaters who were counting on lots of plant eaters to chase down themselves, they very quickly ran out of food and welcome. Um, when we talk about it being a sudden extinction, um, I think it's hard for humans to wrap our mind around 160 million years, 60 million years. Um, if we um, apply um, natural science or the study of evolution, humans at best go back 50,000 years to our modern ancestors, 250,000 to early hominids. So it's hard for us to wrap our mind around what could happen in 150 million years, both from the standpoint of them rising up and being, becoming prominent, but also them being killed off in a relatively short period of time. So when we say they were killed, um, they were, it was sudden and that it was quick. Um, is a million years quick? I mean, could some of the stuff hung on for a million years? Well, most likely. I think just about 10 years ago, they found some plants in Australia um, that are Cretaceous era. So certainly there was some things that survived that, but the large population of dinosaurs in their environment had been radically changed um, by that asteroid collision. And so what we have left then is, um, is fossils from those dinosaurs. Very few dinosaurs or organisms from any time period are actually fossilized. It takes a very specific set of conditions. They have to be immediately covered by material, so they're anaerobic, not exposed to oxygen. There has to be a certain amount of moisture present so that there's a mineral replacement process that occurs, but not so wet that it presents that oxidation and that replacement to occur. And so very, very few fossils are actually survive the whole process of an organism dying, being buried, and um, being able to be found later. And when, so when we use the words fossils, we're generally talking about the skeleton of an animal because that's minerally based mostly calcium. And mineral replacement with minerals is very readily um, done in nature under those conditions. But fossils, the word fossil can be used in broader terms. You can look at the molds and casts of organisms where they made contact with the ground. Uh, trace fossils occur where an animal perhaps passed through the ground, like the example here of the shrimp burrow. Um, 
trees or plant material um, fossilized in a sense. Um, it petrified, which was a replacement process involving um, carbon. And then there's uh, numerous small uh, little things referred to that sign is incorrect. It's microfossils. Um, any small thing that was able to be covered up quickly um, also uh, was preserved in the fossil record. Um, lastly, on this panel, which is part of our display at Makoshika at the Visitor Center, um, is coprolites. Does anyone want to guess what coprolite is? That's right, a dinosaur poop. And the kids love that. Um, but um, I tell them, you know, keep in mind, what do we have to study these dinosaurs? All we have is their skeleton. And what, was that? what if I was to give you a human skeleton and say, describe this species? What color was it? What sounds did it make? Did it have fair, hair, fur, feathers? What color was its skin? How did it react to each other? How did it react as a group or by itself? What did it eat? How did it eat? All we have for dinosaurs is their skeleton. We're just now starting to find some small pieces of soft tissue and stuff to suggest those lifestyles, but almost everything paleontologists know is based on just their bones. So if we have coprolite, that's giving us some great clues towards that organism. We can see perhaps how many of those species were in that area based on how much coprolite is there. Uh, what plant materials in that coprolite to suggest what plants were most prominent at that time? Is there predator coprolite in the area to suggest that they were either at peace or were being pursued? So having any extra clue, such as their poop, is really um, uh, a great leap forward in understanding for dinosaurs since we work only off their skeletons for the most part. But the kids just love it when I say dinosaur poop. <laughs> so what the paleontologists typically study is a couple of very broad um, disciplines that they'll look at and one of the things they look at is diet and dentition because again I can tell you a lot um, about an organism the type of teeth that they have um, and the condition of the teeth uh, dinosaurs um, like sharks had replaceable teeth and as those teeth wore out new teeth would erupt from below and so those teeth were constantly replacing much like sharks well these early plants that early dinosaurs were eating were very high in silica which is very abrasive it would wear their teeth out relatively quickly. And if those teeth didn't replace, uh, most dinosaurs wouldn't have made it to breeding age. Um, we can look at the condition of the teeth to tell us whether it was diet was good or bad and how old it was. We can look at relationships between uh, meat-eating dinosaurs and plant-eating dinosaurs. Um, this uh, plant-eating dinosaur bone has a tooth mark on it um, where it was attacked by a predator. So a lot of great clues can come just from looking at uh, the dentition, uh, jaw bones, and the diet of dinosaurs. Uh, another um, area that is looked at with um, great extensiveness is uh, skeletal structure and mobility. You know, most of us um, at least started out thinking of dinosaurs as big, slow, plodding beasts that plodded along on four feet, the big long necks and stuff. And early on, most of their plant life was low to ground, the ground, ginkgos, cycads, and ferns. Most of their plant uh, food sources were low to the ground, so there was a lot of quadrupedalism. Dinosaurs walking on four feet. Towards the end of the age of dinosaurs, flowering plants or angiosperms were coming into being. And those flowering bodies and fruits were up above their heads. Later species of dinosaurs showed a dramatic shift to bipedalism or being able to operate just on their back two feet. And that gave them two advantages. One, it allowed them to get up on their back feet to reach food sources, new food sources. And second, it allowed them to get on their back feet to run away from predators. Of course, the predators were only one generation behind from figuring that out, and so predators then were also adapting to be better on two feet and to learn to uh, hunt in packs and hunt in coordinated ways so that they could corral these plant eaters, and much like modern mammals do. They're starting to show some of the characteristics and behaviors that would be um, in future years attributable to mammals. Um, so looking at the, the structure, the skeleton, how it moved on the ground, told a lot about its lifestyle, what its challenges were in its place in the whole dinosaur world, and what its successes were. And so that's a good thing because pretty much all you find is bones. So it's a good thing we can find a lot from them. This is a triceratops skull. This is the actual um, skull. It was found on the southern boundary of the park in 1991 by Diane Gabriel. She was a graduate student. Um, from um, Milwaukee Public Museum, doing her graduate work at Museum of the Rockies in Bozeman. Um, her and her volunteer team um, discovered this exposed in the backside of the park, um, excavated it, and it was the impetus for the department um, to put a visitor center at Makoshika. Um, based on the condition of the teeth 
and um, the condition of the frill, it was determined to be a, a juvenile female. How big uh, was it? Pardon? How big? Oh, about as big as it is on the slide. The horns are probably about this long. Um, if you were to sit on the frill, it would be like riding a, and kids have done that, they get up and ride it like a cowboy. So it, it's big enough that you could sit on it and ride it like a saddle. So it, but being a juvenile female, it's still small um, for its species. Um, this was the impetus for the department, put a visitor center there. Um, up to that point, almost all fossil resources from eastern Montana were either going out of state to the museums that were applying for the permits, or they were going to Museum of the Rockies, which is the official repository uh, for paleontology in Montana. And um, the department wisely thought that if we were able to retain some of these fossils on site, we should be able to encourage people to go to actually see those fossils where they're actually originating from versus on a, in a sterile display in another location. So the department in 1994 uh, opened a visitor center at Makoshika, and this is our centerpiece, um, courtesy of Diane Gabriel, who has now passed um, and is um, strongly memorialized in the park for her role in helping uh, promote and encourage Montana State Parks um, to make uh, Makoshika a, a better destination. Um, for Montanans and their guests. Um, recently, um, and again, this is uh, new discoveries every day because they're only, they only have these uh, bones to look at. And so some modern thinking has come about with respect to um, triceratops. Uh, for example, the horns um, were for the longest time thought to be very solid and dense and they're used for fighting and battling. Um, most of the um, Recent discoveries are suggesting that they were hollow for a good portion of the, of the Triceratops life um, and that they may have had uh, multiple roles, um, species identification, intimidation, um, but not for sparring and fighting. Um, the frill, likewise, um, was always believed to be very hard, uh, to be like a, um, a guard for the neck, um, again, for fighting. Uh, recent analysis of Triceratops frill uh, suggest that they were innervated with a nervous system, that they had uh, blood vessels. They may have, like modern reptiles, used it for heating or cooling to regulate their cold-blooded or their metabolic levels. Um, may have changed color to indicate um, breeding status. Um, and um, really uh, wonderfully, um, Denver Fowler at Museum of the Rockies a few years ago did a paper where he was um, challenging or looking into whether the Ceratopsians were, were split out into too many species, and maybe perhaps they were fewer species, and what we were finding was developmental stages of Triceratops, young ones that had not completely um, um, morphed into their adult body. And one of the significant things that Denver was studying was what's known as a fenestra, which is a hole in that frill. Um, and he and some other guys came over to the park, and they were downstairs looking at our collection, and he literally started crying and, and getting all worked up. And he said, I, I don't believe you, I can't believe you have this. He said, you have the, the, only the second known uh, piece of dinosaur frill which supports my theory. And I said, well, what is it about? And he said, I can't tell you until the paper comes out. <laughs> right? <laughs> and so I said, it wouldn't happen to have anything to do with that fenestra. And he goes, <laughs> Yes! <laughs> so he published this paper and Jack Horner roundly thumped him for being um, presupposing and, and going a little too far out on the limb. Um, they, they still believe that the Triceratops are separate species, but it, it points out that there's so much that, that's unknown. Uh, any day those, those great discoveries or those great understandings could be unearthed at any location that has dinosaur fossils, including Makoshika. So it's neat to see that uh, casting of that on display there. Um, every time I see that, I think of Denver, just, I can't tell you. Can I guess? Yeah, you guessed. Um, but now, going back to that extinction now, um, again, 70-90% of all plant and animal life was killed in North America and soon globally, but not everything was killed by that asteroid. And today, we can see out there in nature, turtles, um, garfish, um, sharks, paddlefish, sturgeon, um, all these organisms were alive during the time of dinosaurs. And they did not go extinct with the asteroid collision. So I'll ask the students, why do you think that is? And maybe we want to take a shot at it? That's right, they were all in a marine environment. And that marine environment had a different life cycle. And it had a different food cycle. These organisms didn't require hundreds of pounds of food a day. And the meat eaters didn't require to hunt down a plant eater every day. 
they had a different life cycle and the ocean is a little more um, stable with respect to its biotics. And so many of the things in the ocean at that time did survive the asteroid collision. And to this day, we have paddlefish, and sturgeon, garfish, turtles, sharks, and crocodilians that were alive during dinosaur times and still are alive today. Um, before I go to uh, mention the, most, the greatest survivor of the impact of the collision of the asteroid, one last look at why Makoshka is the way it is, and that's because of what's called an anticline. Uh, an anticline is like a, uh, like a fold in a blanket. And so, you know, what, 80 million years ago, the Rockies were upthrusting? Um, about 50, 60 million years ago, the Black Hills were. Um, so as, as the North American plate hit the Pacific plate, and it was putting torsional strength on it, mountain rise, mountains were rising. Well, the pressure that wasn't taken off by the mountains had to give somewhere. So in between those mountain ranges, we see all these anticlinal folds. They're sort of like ripples in a blanket. And Makoshika sits on the northern terminus of the Cedar Creek anticline, which is about 150 miles long. It trends southeast into South Dakota. Um, anticlines have become very popular for oil and gas exploration because as those layers came up, it brought little domes of gas and oil up with it and brought it up closer to the surface. So these guys skip along these anticlines and, and punch holes to find these gas and oil pockets. Um, but what it also did, most notably for us, is it, it uplifted those lower sediment layers. And by uplifting them, it kind of fractured and rattled them, and that allowed uh, recent modern surface weather to downcut and erode through those layers and expose those lower layers and the treasures that are in them. And so it is, um, and this is a, a cross section of it. Um, you can see over here, this is the park. Um, this is about five miles south of town. Um, and you can start seeing those marine sediments that I was showing you earlier on. As you see in the park, it does not downcut into those lower layers enough to expose the marine sediments, but it does downcut into the Hell Creek formation to expose those dinosaur form formations. Um, and that results in the stratigraphy that we see in the park today. Um, this is uh, from our visitor center again, um, and this kind of explains what you're going to see when you're in the park. Um, this is a photograph of uh, the hill up behind our amphitheater, and this is a diorama which matches that. Down here at the very bottom, this brown material is some of that sea-laid sediment, uh, the bare paw shale, um, that is below the park that's not exposed. But this little tan layer here is referred to as Fox Hill sandstone. It's about 60 mil 68 million years old, and it is the last of the seaway sediment. It's sort of akin to uh, shoreline, where waves are lapping at a shoreline. It is just starts to be visible in the lower pieces of the park. The majority of the park, or the bottom two-thirds of the park, is Hell Creek formation. And these are the clays and the shales of the last two to three million years of the age of dinosaurs. Again, when dinosaurs were at their height with respect to their evolutionary advancement and their success. The top one-third of the park is Fort Union formation. And that's early deposition from the age of mammals following the extinction of dinosaurs. And my understanding is it's not contiguous that there was some layers between those two, and scrubbing had occurred probably from um, the breaking or releasing of glacial lakes and surface erosion, so that these two layers, the Fort Union and the Cretaceous, are not contiguous, but in the park currently today, they do contact each other. On top of that is what's referred to as cap rocks. In other parts of the country, they're called hoodoos, humbugs, spires. And essentially what it is is these uh, composed of sandstone, which is a coarser material, and it required stronger water movement to move that material. So when these clays and shales were laid down, it was much like I mentioned Louisiana, delta swamps. So you had fine stuff filtering out of water and filtering down. This sand material was being moved by stronger moving surface water. And so it created these large lenses of sandstone in the hills. And then as it was uplifted and eroded down, the sandstone resisted the erosion much greater than the clays and shales. And as a result, it would leave these large sandstone blocks uh, precariously balanced on top of uh, clay pillars. Um, some of them erode to be some wonderfully um, uh, imaginative shapes. Um, a lot of people have given names to them over the years. There's areas in the park where they're called baked potato because it looks like a bunch of baked potatoes sitting out there. Uh, we had a formation called Mrs. Butterworth because she looked like the, the syrup jar. 
Um, about five years ago, Mrs. Butterworth's head fell off. Um, <laughs> so, um, but a, a, that's part of the process. Uh, the last thing I left out was this black line. That black line is that iridium splash layer that marks the extinction of dinosaurs. It used to be called the KT boundary, which stood for the Cretaceous Tertiary boundary. The Cretaceous period, 135 to 65 million years ago. Tertiary period, 65 to present. Um, Geopaleontologists felt that that was too broad to refer to it just as the tertiary, so now they are preferring that it call, be called the KP boundary, the Cretaceous Paleogene boundary. Paleo, Paleogene being a geological um, time length more consistent or more in alignment with that time period. Um, K, if you're wondering why K stands for Cretaceous, is because C was already taken for Carboniferous. So they, they had to use K for Cretaceous. So I know, confusing, right? And it used to be KT, now it's the KP. That extinction line, that KP boundary, and that ir iridium splash layer is present in the park. It's only about a millimeter thick, and on the hill, it's way up here where the bottom two-thirds of the clays and shales meet the top third, which is more of tan in color. So you can go up into the park and you can actually touch the line that contains the evidence of dinosaurs going extinct on Earth. Um, this is a photograph from outside our visitor center, and this shows you really um, well where that KT bound KP boundary is. This is an old slide. Um, I'm down here at the visitor center. It's about 600 feet between the tops of the hills and the bottom. Um, so about two-thirds of the way up where that gray meets that tan is the KP boundary. That is the extinction of dinosaurs on Earth, and it's beautifully expressed all through the park. This is what um, early people of the area would have seen. They would not have seen the lowland delta swamps. They would not have seen the deposition being made. What they saw was the result of the uplifting of that deposition and its erosion and downcutting. Um, so the early peoples of Montana, of eastern Montana, um, have a very, very old and very prominent history at Makoshka. There's evidence in Makoshka of early peoples dating back 10 to 12,000 years which is fairly old for Montana. We had a, a great program done by Ruth Ann Knutson last year. Uh, she's part of the Humanities, um, Montana Humanities Speakers Bureau. A uh, great program, gives a lot of great information on early humans uh, in Montana. And she, her, her dating goes back to about 13,000 years. So 10 to 12,000 years old is very old for archeological or human evidence um, in eastern Montana. And there's uh, evidence found of them capitalizing on the, uh, the flora and fauna of the area, evidence of them butchering animals. This is Paleo Dude. Um, it's actually um, partly based on an old manager, uh, not the dress, I, <laughs> not the uniform. That's non-uniform clothing there. Uh, but that just kind of gives you an idea of, uh, so people can make that connection, that there was a, there was a, a long time period between early peoples and modern tribes. They, they embraced the same technology, the same lifestyle. They were nomadic. They were hunter-gatherers. They followed um, large animals, which they then processed for the hide and for the food, and they gathered plants seasonally. Um, the Paleo-Indians suffered their own environmental challenges. Um, following that seaway leaving and stuff, North America for many millions of years underwent periods where it was dry and arid like a desert, and then there was numerous ice ages. And they had to, um, the last ice age was I believe the Wisconsin, which is about 12,000 years ago, and you can see it created uh, glacial lakes, and most of you have heard of Glacial Lake Missoula. There was a glacial lake Glendive, and it probably contributed significantly to the downcutting and erosion of the park. But these early Paleo-Indians, um, much like the early dinosaurs, they were following the edge of that restriction on their resource. And so as a result, we find very prominent archaeological records in the Glendive area and the Makoshika area. Uh, we also find a lot of evidence that they had a great preference in utilization of the woolly mammoth. Um, there's three mammoths on this board. The one found in our area is the big one. Um, in comparison, a modern African elephant would be smaller than the smallest mammoth here. Um, we had the largest mammoth in the area. Um, that other slide that showed them digging, that's a site in Lindsay, about 30 miles west of Glendive, where they found evidence of the carcass being utilized, rocks being moved into place to break bones open. Um, prior to humans being in North America, North America had a full complement of wildlife that was consistent with the other continents. Um, North America had um, 
hippopotamuses and rhinos and, and uh, giant cats and bears and elephants and camels and stuff like that, they all went extinct over time as that climate changed to not be supportive for them. And it goes back to, again, those continents breaking apart. There's shared animal lineage across those continents, just like there was shared dinosaur lineage. When the early peoples were in Montana, the mammoth was the primary large mammal left for them to utilize. And it was uh, much like modern tribes, it was very extensively utilized for food and shelter and such. And so what we have at Makoshka is about 12,000 years of archeological evidence from early Paleo Indians, which had a, uh, a large focus on um, near Clovis Point era stone technology um, to the um, stone points of more modern tribes, which in uh, the Makoshka area is predominantly Lakota Sioux. Um, there was um, plenty of interaction between Crow and Cheyenne. Um, um, often many of the tribes from Western Montana would meet in the plains and they would exchange um, information and goods and supplies. Um, but in our area, the Lakota, um, the Sioux were the, um, um, the prominent um, tribes. And so there's great archaeological record from the early peoples of 12,000 years ago up through present day in the park. There's some significant archaeological sites. So that dovetails with what I said earlier on, that even though dinosaurs is our big thing, and what we have uh, the most to toot our horn about, there really is a significant archaeological record in the park as well. Okay, so that kind of brought us up to, you know, the 1800s or so. I thought, okay, let's just go ahead and continue on to modern days. And I'll talk a little bit about the, the local and the park history. So we got into the late 1800s. Uh, dinosaurs were discovered in, I believe, England um, was the first dinosaur discovery. And many of the museums on the east coast of the United States uh, caught dinosaur fever. Cope and Marsh, these guys were the curators and the paleontologists for like the American Museum of Natural History. And they got into a bidding war. They got into a competition to see who could gather the most dinosaur stuff. So there was, they were literally hauling train loads of dinosaur bones out of the central United States back to the East Coast and putting them into their collections. Um, they were sabotaging each other's collections. They were sending out scouts, and one of the scouts observed hundreds of triceratops skulls sitting on the surface of the earth. And uh, as this stuff was being eroded and exposed and then breaking down, and it's really interesting to, to think about that because uh, Native Americans have a very strong spiritual connection to the earth, an animistic and an animalistic connection to the earth where um, inanimate and animate objects contain spiritual power. The park is referred to as Mako Sika in the Lakota language, which means bad land or land of bad earth uh, or land of bad spirits. And so you can imagine being in that time period and seeing these massive skulls, these massive skeletons on the earth, and spiritually what it would have meant to them to, to recognize the power that was contained in those. So the, the museums on the East Coast were just trucking trainloads of stuff back um, to the museums, and um, the park kind of blipped on their radar. So by the late 1890s was some of the first proposals by locals to have it formally recognized. Um, and uh, some local ranchers like Morris Kane and, and Andrew Larson uh, petitioned the federal government to take ownership of it. And the, the feds and some locals punched some of the first road into the park, did some exploration, and uh, the feds decided that they didn't want it, that it duplicated what was already in their inventory. So they passed on the offer. And it, so it sat just as a local treasure for a number of years after that, um, still being known as the land of bad spirits, and, but early advocacy in the area continued. Um, this is a picture from, oh boy, I don't know, I don't know what, 50s, 60s, uh, 40s, yeah. Um, the park was extensively used by the locals. It was considered their park and, and a treasure to them. And so that advocacy conti continued in the local community. Um, that advocacy um, peaked with um, Catherine Kalk and A.J. McCarty. This cabin is the nucleus to the park becoming a state park. Um, in the early 1930s, the owner of the local body house in Glendive, do you guys know what a body house is? <laughs> do, 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 right, burlesque. He, he built this cabin up in the park so his body girls had a place to rest on their days off. And the McCarty's bought it in the 30s and they renovated it and they used it as a summer retreat. 
And so all through the 30s, the McCartys, and Catherine Culp McCarty, um, uh, she, was, she spent her childhood day, years up there and just had a great love for it. As the family aged and passed on, they wanted, to, they wanted other people to be able to appreciate the magic that they felt there. So they donated the cabin and a quarter section of land around it to the county in hopes that it would become a park, either a county park or a state park. And that was 1939. Um, the rest of their property they sold off. The park itself, the land was a mishmash of, of federal and county land sections of land. Um, it sat until 1953 when uh, Montana made it a Montana State Park. We did not have ownership of the cabin at that time, um, but we started acquiring land around the cabin and we had easement to it so that we could protect the cabin. This is on a private end holding currently, but back then it was known as the Sunling Supper Club and through the um, and this might go back to prohibition, um, because I had talked to a guy who said they used to hide bootleg in the basement. But this was a supper club up in the park, and the locals would drive up into the park, and they'd have supper, and they'd play the gaming machines, which they weren't supposed to have, and then they'd drive off the backside of the park, and that's what they would do on weekends. They'd go up, and it was owned by the Sunlings, and it was called the Sunlings Supper Club. Um, so this early advocacy finally resulted in the state recognizing it as having a value for Montanans in general as well as just the locals. And in 1953, it was made a Montana State Parks. And again, we celebrated our 50th and just celebrated our 60th. Um, so out of 75 years for the history of Montana State Parks, we're 50 years old. So we're one of the old timers in the park system. Um, discovery is still ongoing in the park. Um, this is a picture from uh, the excavation of the Triceratops skull. And more recently, um, this is a picture of a Thescalosaur. This is a cast of a Thescalosaur, uh, which is a very rare uh, species of dinosaur, late Cretaceous species. It was an herbivore, bipedal, about 11 feet long. Uh, it was encased in a piece of sandstone. Uh, when it was sent to the Museum of the Rockies, they weren't able to extricate it. So they made a casting of the fossil to the extent that they were able to take it out of the rock and sent us that casting. Um, you could see the Black Hawk helicopter. It had to be lifted out of the backcountry. Um, earlier on, somebody was talking about whether that picture had been hiked to or whether it was aerial. It's very, very difficult to work in that country. It's over 100 degrees. It's like um, Grand Canyon. It's over 100 degrees down in those coolies with no water, no shade. So some of these big things are just simply too heavy to lift out by humans. So sometimes they're lifted out um, by helicopters. So this is an ongoing thing. Um, and ongoing in ways that perhaps we don't give as much credit to. Um, we are about dinosaurs and we are about archaeology, but um, we get about 75,000 visitors a year. Um, a good portion of them are non-resident, and these non-residents come from around the world, and there's many things that they have not seen in their life. And Makoshka is the first Montana State Park inside the North Dakota border. It gives a, a great welcome um, to visitors to Montana, and it gives them their first opportunity to perhaps see things that they've never seen in their life, things that we may take, um, uh, uh, take for advantage or, or think as common, uh, such as mule deer, uh, mountain lions. Um, many of our visitors, um, non-resident visitors, this is their first opportunity to see a mountain lion or a mule deer. They come from the uh, East Coast where there are not mule deer. Um, so um, our department is attempting to uh, provide a wildlife display up in the mezzanine of the visitor center um, so we can showcase the plant and animal life of Makoshika uh, for visitors who are not, perhaps not able to go out into the park, either because of their own limitations or because of seasonal closures in the park on the road system that prevents them from getting out there. Um, this is a big male mountain lion that was uh, trapped um, mistakenly on the outside of the park. And um, it was collectively used as a learning tool. The Montana Taxidermy Association um, did a, a symposium in Miles City. They all donated their time um, the, our friends group, the department, and some locals bought the materials, and they did a wonderful job mounting it and, and gifting it to Montana State Parks for the Visitor Center um, because it's a very elusive creature that is out in that Badlands topography. It's all over the place, and you rarely see them. This gives an opportunity for people, perhaps first time to this country, let alone this state, uh, to see things um, that Montana has to share. Okay. Um, so I've kind of taken you all the way from before even dinosaurs to what we're doing right here today. And so now that you kind of have a feel for what's underneath the park and what the treasure is that we're taking out, 
I thought it'd be good to do a little resource management tour, kind of take you on a quick road tour through the park and give you an idea what the park looks like should you visit it, which I'm sure you will. Um, of course, our greatest resource is, is people. Um, we've got great staff both at the park and in Montana State Parks. They do a tremendous job providing all those parks um, on oftentimes a challenging budget, the staffing levels, and they um, alone deserve our support with what they um, preserve in perpetuity for Montanans. Um, the park also has a very strong friends group with Friends of Makoshka. It's a 501c3, so we have, um, through them, access to great funding mechanisms, which has provided some great improvements in the park over the years. This is a map that used to be in the old brochure, and it kind of gives you a feel for the park. And it's going to be my little uh, guide as we uh, zip on down the road. And there's Glendive, and we're located right on the edge of Glendive. Um, this is the park, 11,531 acres. Um, each of these is a section of land, one square mile, so it's about 18 square miles of land. Uh, one of the challenges, of course, is how do you navigate in that land? Um, it, and it's actually the opposite of the mountains. In the mountains, you follow the river through the valleys of the mountains. In the badlands, you get up on top. You get up on a bench, and you skirt along the top and drop across saddles and get back on another bench. So what you see here is the road system. Uh, the first two miles of the road are paved. There's a series of switchbacks here which is a, uh, a challenge for us in providing access to the rest of the park seasonally. The rest of the dark line is improved surface gravel, and the, the dotted line is unimproved road. Um, I kind of refer to the park as having three levels of development. Um, a developed recreational corridor, the first two miles, that's accessible by any vehicle. It's accessible year-round. It has many of our standard large offerings like camping and stuff. If you're able to navigate the switchbacks and you get up on this big meadow up here, we have what I call a semi-developed recreation area. That's where we have less developed camping, hiking trails, scenic overlooks, and such. Uh, beyond the saddle, the unimproved road gets worse the further you go out, especially out in this area. It becomes very seasonally restrictive. But what it does is it gives you access to very large, quiet pieces of the park that most people don't take advantage of. But you can see, even with 12 miles of road, a significant amount of the park is untouched by human development. And it is the, the immensity and the solitude of those large areas that can give visitors that inspiration should they make the challenge and hike back into those areas. So I'm going to do a quick little road tour through here and stop at some of the prominent features that we have. Um, this is an aerial version of it. Again, you can see the road is challenged. Unlike mountains, we follow up this valley like the mountains, but then we pop up on top. And this is a big meadow. And then you can see the road follows and cuts across these little saddles and stays up on the high ground. And so this is, and there's the boundary of the park. So this is kind of an aerial view of what we're going to be looking down on. At the park entrance is the manager's residence. Um, it used to be owned by a local family, the Dowsons. I don't know exactly when the department um, purchased it. The house was built in 1960, and I know there was at least um, part-time management presence at the park in the 70s. Um, going through the 80s, where the local game warden um, would uh, occupy the residence and provide safety and security to the park. Um, it wasn't until um, the mid to late 80s that there was a full-time management presence at the park. Um, so the manager's residence is at the entrance to the park, and below it is the shop complex, which provides for our physical operations. Just inside the park entrance, next to the manager's house, is the park's visitor center. Um, this is the first slide, that, um, like that first one, that's going to give you that sense of scale or a sense of depth. Um, it's called Witch's Hat, and it's a prominent peak outside the visitor center. We used to tell the kids go hike until we were told that we shouldn't do that because it's too dangerous. Um, <laughs> but the visitor center was, uh, again, the impetus was that skull that Diane Gabriel found. So the visitor center was built, and grand opening was in uh, 1994. It's about 6,000 square feet, of which about 4,000 square feet is usable for interpretive and educational uses. Um, this gives you an idea of somebody who climbed up near the top of Witch's Hat to look back down at the visitor center. So you can start to see the scale that's possible. Certainly it's not the scale of, of Rocky Mountains where you're looking down thousands of feet. But it does belie a lot of people don't give credit to the scale that is possible in eastern Montana and in the Badlands. I do believe it's why the eastern Montana why it's called Big Sky Country. It's got a tremendously broad view. So getting up 600 feet in this country gives you tremendous commanding views all the way down to uh, Glendive on the Yellowstone River Valley and down on the visitor center from up on Witch's Hat. It also gives you your first hint on 
you can see the magic of that erosion. You can see how everything cut down step, stair, step, stair, like the Grand Canyon, exposing lower and lower sediment layers and their resources. Now, if you were standing up there at Witch's Hat looking off the other side of that ridge, um, you can see um, there's the Yellowstone River uh, Railroad Bridge uh, all across the valley and up to the airport. Term, uh, very commanding views um, when you get up in the high country of the park. That is where um, our first um, recreational offering starts. The Bluebird Trail is our most, one of our most recent trail additions. It's about a mile long. Um, it winds behind the visitor center, goes up to a little knob. Um, it gives the uh, people um, a first taste of what it's like hiking in Badlands. And if they wish to um, take a more strenuous hike, we have um, str more strenuous options available. Um, but hiking and recreational opportunities start immediately right at the park entrance. Half mile down the road is our group use shelter. It's 30 by 60. Um, this was a great success um, in with partnership with our friends group, Friends of Makoshka. Um, the department uh, made it a capital improvement project, and the Friends group uh, qualified for a $48,000 tip grant um, to provide in a kind funding for it. It is um, located in that first two miles, so it's available year round, um, and it's the nucleus for much of our special events and programming. Um, great facility. One mile down the road is our main campground, Cairns Campground. Um, it currently does not have much for development. It's dry camping. It doesn't have hookups, electricity, or water. That's something that we are um, continuing trying to do is, is to improve the quality of the camping experience at Cairns Campground to include city water service, um, electrical, um, another host site, um, a program area. Um, and that's really important because, again, two miles in is that set of switchbacks. Half of the year, you're not able to travel um, by motorized means past that first two miles. So that switchback really restricts what you're able to gain half of the year. So having developed camping located conveniently at the entrance of the park is really, really important, especially for our non-resident travelers who are making Makoshka their first stop in Montana. So we're trying to make great efforts to improve the camping experience there. Again, another... Um, a nature trail located at the campground, this one in honor of Diane Gabriel. And th that trail is very popular with our um, educational programming. Between the shelter and the campground on the other side of the road is a disc golf course. It would probably be the most unique disc golf course you've ever played. Um, <laughs> it is an 18-hole course. Um, it's about halfway to being PDGA um, sanctionable for tournaments. And we did have some tournament guys play it who said you do a few little things and it will be on the tournament circuit. Um, it's tremendously fun to play. If you like disc golf, um, I don't imagine you'll find a better course than that to play. As the road leaves now, going up to get up on top, it, it is paved now. This is an old-timey picture. Um, and now we are approaching that set of switchbacks right there. And you can see, as you're starting up those switchbacks, you're starting to gain that view. The switchbacks are very narrow and very winding. They're also very steep. There is points where it's an 18% grade and it averages to about a 15% grade. Its steepness, its narrowness, and windingness um, uh, restricts a lot of um, vehicles from getting up there, large RVs and stuff. So the top side of the park tends to be very pretty, very quiet. Um, we've always been challenged with those switchbacks. Um, this is, uh, you wouldn't get away with this unless you were like uh, Pee Wee Herman. Um, <laughs> but in deference, that's Doc Hyatt, a local op uh, optometrist who was one of our greatest advocates for paleontology in the park. But Doc Hyatt is standing there on a slump. It was 1978 that this, it's an ongoing thing. This land continually wants to move. And I always like to say erosion is our best friend and our worst enemy. It's our best friend because without erosion, this park wouldn't be here. We wouldn't have the beauty we have. But it's our worst enemy because every year it's going to take a piece of road or it's going to take a piece of trail. It's going to challenge our ability to provide access. So you can see that um, going all back through the park's history, um, the, this set of switchbacks has been really, really a challenge for us. Uh, this picture was taken last summer. Um, we had a significant slump a couple years ago. And last summer, the Montana National Guard, Red Horse Squadron out of Great Falls and an engineering unit out of Miles City came and they did some heavy lifting for us with their big army gear. And they did a lot of the heavy grading on, on which now the contractor is doing some of the finish work this year. But you can see the scale of it and you can see how this whole thing wants to go bye-bye. And you see that line right there? Well, 
and again, scale, an excavator and an army bulldozer, and erosion, like rust, it never sleeps. The challenge is that that provides the greatest amount of access to the greatest amount of the park, so it's always going to be a challenge for us, um, and it's always going to be our number one priority. Okay, now we're above the switchbacks, and you again, now you're up into the top, you're up into that meadow. Immediately we have semi-developed camping opportunities. The trails now, instead of being down below, they're up top, and they're giving you commanding views down into those coolies and down into the river valley. Some tremendous erosional features, natural bridges. And now we've reached this point right here, what's called Radio Hill. And what this is, is gives you a choice between going to the rest of the semi-improved area or dropping across that saddle and going to the primitive area. If you go left at that junction into the semi-developed area, you immediately go into McCarty Meadow. McCarty's cabin is down here off the side of the meadow looking down into the coulee we just came up. Across from McCarty, and there is her cabin, across from McCarty cabin is Pine on Rocks Campground. It's a semi-developed camping area. Um, Beautiful views from the campsites. Great places to have your morning coffee. Great places to have your evening tea. And I don't have a picture of the stars um, yet. Um, but it's very beautiful at night, too. Very little light pollution. Just around the corner from um, Pine Elm Rocks Campground is the Hyatt Amphitheater. Again, named for Doc Hyatt, uh, the man you saw in that earlier picture. Um, you saw that earlier picture of those old-timey, the old-timey picture from the 40s or 50s? They had been using the amphitheater since the late 30s, early 40s for church service. Um, so it had very strong significance to the local community, and we took it upon ourselves, and the Friends of Makoshka took it upon themselves to improve it and make it um, better. It used to just be old railroad ties, um, and you can see the cross. It used to be used for church services. Um, Again, through um, their 501c3 status and funding and the department making a capital improvement projects, um, it was renovated. Um, all new seating, all new tiering, uh, stage work, electrical, um, modern vault latrines, a food service area. Uh, and now it, it is, we like to say, the best outdoor amphitheater in Montana. And I've, no one, I've always said that no one sent me a picture to challenge me. So <laughs> I'm, I'm going to stick with it that it is the best. Um, very popular locally for weddings. Um, reunions and family gatherings. This is looking down. When you get to that amphitheater where the road turns around, you can see that's the base of the switchbacks. You're now looking down Cain's Coulee back to where we started. So you see the immense scale of the land. Okay, we're going to come back to the saddle and we're going to drop off the saddle. This is another engineering challenge for us. You can see it comes from one large flat area to another large flat area, and this is just a saddle winding across, and it also has a tendency to slip and slide and want to go away. But once you're across the saddle, you're into the primitive road system. These roads are impassable when wet. The, the clays and the shales of that area are worse than ice to drive on when wet. Locally, it's called gumbo, and what happens is it just fills the tread of your tire, and it's like having Frankenstein boots. And literally, you can just be standing there, and you feel yourself sliding off, and there's nothing you can do. It's worse than ice. So it makes it a challenge for people to get out and enjoy it if the weather's not perfect. But some of the more primitive, quiet areas of the park are located back on those unimproved roads. A Valley View Loop is a loop area back off that road, which um, has a, another great commanding view down Hagenson's Coulee to the river bottom. Great primitive campsites if you really want to get away from it all. And now we've passed Valley Loop and we're coming to this junction here. Um, let me step back once and just say there's only two private end holdings in the park. This section here is owned by adjacent landowner, and this quarter section is owned by the Glendive Lions. So reaching that junction is the Lions Youth Camp. Um, they're a great partner with us. They let us use their facility for our youth program, camp out and such. Um, they now call it Sleepy Hollow instead of Suddling Supper Club. Um, they have a series of sleeping cabins, and that's the main lodge with the cooking and bathroom facilities. But their claim to fame is their A-frame. It's a 30 by 60 A-frame up uh, with a very commanding view of the park. Beautiful deck. Again, very popular for weddings and uh, reunions. A great view down into the Badlands, of course. 
Inside, it's, it's uh, very homey. It's uh, wood heated. And it has sleeping levels all the way up to the top. There's like four sleeping levels. So one kid undoubtedly will climb all the way up to the top where it's only like this high. But it's a, it's a wonderful place. It's got a commercial kitchen. It's really a beautiful place. And it's available to the public uh, $150 a night for the entire lodge. Yeah. And you have to have a special vehicle to get into it? If it's raining, you have to have a very special vehicle, yeah. <laughs> one that can fly. <laughs> <laughs> Across the road from them is Makoshika Bowman. It's a, a bow camp. Um, they lease the surface from us. Um, they just recently did some improvements, put in a clubhouse and stuff. It, they have like over 30 full body targets set across in the hills in a walking course. Uh, elevated stands, all, all species. It's really a tremendous course if you're into bow hunting. It's like $5 for a day use, $25 for an annual for the family. And now we've reached at that junction. Um, we have it now signed as Vista Trail. Uh, beyond that, the road condition is, is somewhat of a concern with respect to safety and security. And while we assess the future of that portion of the road, we're capitalizing on making it accessible for non-motorized use, walking, biking, horses, backcountry camping, um, very, it, which makes it even a more quiet area of the park because there's no motor vehicle traffic at any time past that point now. So now we've uh, come out all the way out to these overlooks here, the sun's setting. And so I thought, let's go back to the visitor center and talk just very briefly about some of the challenges we have, uh, management challenges. Um, I know in the um, program materials it said impacts of humans. Um, that's certainly one of the greatest uh, management challenges we have. And then I'll talk a little quickly about uh, programs. So looking at some of the management issues and human impacts, many of them are your bread and butter that you'll find anywhere, of course. Um, historical use, historical mindsets, historical ways of using land, um, plenty of stuff. Uh, there was somebody who tried to get <laughs> out there at the wrong time and they were in there like, forget it, leave it. Um, lots of junk and stuff out in the country from the sheep herder period, from bootleggers and stuff like that. Um, of course, vandalism, that's present everywhere. Um, for whatever reason, one of the favorite hobbies at Makoshka is using the picnic tables for firewood. Um, so, And of course, what country fund wouldn't be complete without seeing what your Ford or Chevy can push around. So they like to push outhouses around. A modern version of outhouse tipping, I guess. Uh, theft, of course. Fossil theft. Um, probably not as broad as um, we once feared. But in a broader context, the scientific community has to be concerned about fossil theft. And you go on eBay and you can find all kinds of uh, fossils which listed coming from the Hell Creek Formation, which is where Makoshka is sighted. It probably didn't come from the park, but it shows you that um, people are going to take home and sell whatever they wish, including dinosaur fossils. So fossil theft is something we keep on the radar. Um, again, like many places, we have noxious weeds, primarily leafy spurge. Um, we do apply uh, integrated pest management. We have biological, mechanical, um, and sheep. <laughs> I could tell you some great stories about the sheep herder. He was a Basque sheep herder from South America. And he didn't know English unless you were a lady. Then he knew really good English. <laughs> it's very hot there, and he didn't want to leave his little sheep track. So the sheep would get lost down in the canyon. And I'd come up, and I'd say, you've got two sheep down at the campground. He said, voulez-vous pas? No, two sheep. Sheep, voulez -vous? And so um, we had a seasonal worker named Sherry. I said, Sherry, are you going up top? Uh, tell him that there's still sheep down at the campground. He comes back, he's like, that guy's smooth. I said, what did he say? I said, I want I said, you got two sheep. He's like, hey, baby, what's up? <laughs> like, I knew he knew what I was saying. Two sheep, bah. Anyhow, we, we do use integrated pest management. Uh, we use mechanical, we pull it, we spray it. We use biological. Um, we uh, put biological control bugs out on it, and um, for a number of years we ran sheep on it. Um, but as you know, noxious weeds are difficult to get rid of, even with the best applications. Of course, as with anywhere else, of course, fire. Loose stock, you can imagine it's very difficult to fence that land. So we have issues with um, livestock um, migrating in from adjacent land, including the horses, belongs to Charlie, the neighbor. Oddly enough, about half the visitors of the park think that's wonderful. They think they're wild horses and let them go. And the other half are like, you're getting paid for that pasture, aren't you? So it's kind of a mixed feeling on some of these. Um, uh, but it is, from a standpoint of land management, it's something that we don't have 
you know, imminent control over. So we do have some ingress from local agriculture. View shed, in a broader term, um, there's uh, radio towers in the park. We've tried consolidating them. This is up on top on that McCarty Meadow area. Um, there was about you know, 15 or so at one point. We've done some consolidation, but um, anything that's going to impact that larger view shed is also a management concern. And then there's a what I call community sentiments. Um, there used to be a rifle range in the park way down by the, between the visitor center and the campground. It was put in in the 70s. Well, in the 1970s, there wasn't a visitor center or a campground or a shelter or anything else. So it, had, it was very suitable for the area, and it had very strong uh, significance for the local community. Um, as the park developed and put in those facilities, the rifle range, from a safety and security per standpoint, became the odd man out. And so the department created an even better range, or a comparable range, outside of the park, and it was not taken well by the local by components of the local community who again they have a very strong personal connection to the park and um, they did not want to see that rifle range leave even though uh, it, it was the best decision with respect to providing the greatest opportunities in the park um, sometimes what you battle is perspective and perspective is sometimes contained within one era or one generation and um, so there's some uh, very historical sentiment and connection to the park Okay, special events and programs, as you can imagine, we have a um, very uh, broad spectrum of programming. We have a youth program, first Thursday of June through first Thursday of August. Um, uh, every Thursday morning we have a youth program. It's very well attended by the local kids. Um, we do educational tours to the local schools. Almost all the local schools uh, come out for school tours. We have campfire programs up at Hyatt Amphitheater. I can't imagine a better place to have an outdoor program um, and those are typically every other Thursday evening throughout the summer. We've participated in many environmental um, awareness um, uh, functions, such as March for Parks. Um, we've done Elder Hostel. We um, are currently doing um, wilderness walks to the Montana Wilderness Association. Our main signature event is Buzzard Day. And that's on the second Saturday of June every year. Um, it's a full day festival type um, feature. It's got uh, uh, food, uh, nature walks, uh, things for the kids to do, a disc golf tournament. Um, but the, the, our claim to fame for that is the buzzard run, and we call it Montana's toughest 10K. It involves running up those switchbacks. So it really is a tough 10K. And, that, um, and that's our signature event, and, and oftentimes it'll end with a concert in the evening up at the amphitheater. And no group that's performed at that concert ever said that they didn't want to return. Please let us return and play here again. We used to do a lot of um, local theater um, um, organized by the local high school drama club in at the amphitheater. And um, for about five years now, Montana Shakespeare in the parks, their Glendive performance is at the park. Um, they came out to the park for whatever reason. They used to do it in the city park, and they came out, they did it at the park, and they have wanted to come back every night. In fact, one year, they requested to do a night performance under the lights so that they, uh, I think it was Romeo and Juliet. But look, look at the backdrop on that. I mean, it's a tremendous venue for outdoor theater. We've been in a few parades. Early on, I was real excited to do strange things, so I created these, this float, and that was a big T-Rex, and the head went back and forth, and, and it made roaring noises. And we had a kid sitting in the front, sitting on a stool with his little T-Rex arms. <laughs> We won, uh, we won the Blue Ribbon for a um, for, uh, nonprofit group that year. And then uh, this was uh, another idea of mine. This was about the time, I think it was the self, Second Gulf War, and they called it Shock and Awe. So I said, we're going to shock them this year. We're going to do Shock and Awe. We used this old mower that we couldn't use anymore, and then there was a brush hog. So I made Triceratops and a baby Triceratops over it, and you could drive around in it. <laughs> and, the, and the little baby would follow it, so we called it Shock and Awe. <laughs> So, no kidding. In the, so in the parade, we're going around, and every time i come over and stop in front of the kids, they'd go, aww. <laughs> That's aww. I'm shocked. <laughs> so it was really fun, scooting around in the parade. Kind of like the Shriners on their little go-karts. It was really fun. Um, at the Visitor Center, we've got a pretty strong retail program. We've got a pretty strong retail program in Montana State Parks. Most of the um, Visitor Centers and the regional offices um, have uh, merchandise lines. Um, and most of them at the parks are focused on the resource of the park. We've got a great park store 
uh, where you can get uh, everything from toys to um, books which help explain the resource of the park. Um, a wonderful opportunity to get some more information and to take home a memento uh, during your visit. Ma Makoshka has its own license plate. Um, and unlike most of them, it's a one-time fee. You pay $65. You don't pay an annual fee. You just pay it one time. So uh, it's a great way to show support um, for Montana State Parks and for Makoshka State Park is to get our personalized plate. All right. I'm going to let a couple pictures pass by for you, and then it'll be a few minutes for questions. It went a little longer than I was expecting. I'm sorry about that. Um, let a couple pictures pass by and take a couple of quick questions, and I can follow up with you personally after that if you had uh, a need for more information. So just kind of enjoy a few pictures. And like I said at the beginning, I think out of what you see, one of these is going to want to make you uh, visit Makoshika. Thank you for joining me tonight to talk about Makoshka. Please join me and the rest of Montana State Parks at Makoshka and any of the other 54 state parks available to you. If you have any questions, um, please let me know. I'll be here for a few minutes. Thank you.